Good morning. In just a minute, we're going to go to the Word of God. I'd like to take uh, just a moment to express my appreciation to our congregation. Uh, I don't ever recall being away from the church for five weeks and ever having things, as far as I was concerned, as I call back, everything was running smooth as could be. Thanks for taking care of everything. I hope under, in the future it'll be under different circumstances. Five weeks, was a, it was good to, to know that you were praying for our family. And I'd like to just extend a special appreciation uh, for Peter's message last week. I caught that online. Stillness. The week before was Elder Mitch Williams focusing on Jesus. I may have those out of order. Week before that was VBS. Thank you, Linda, for your leadership and the uh, entire crew that made that possible. And Jeff Parks preaching, Frank Haynes, Eric and Richard uh, on the close to 4th of July, the 2nd of July. We greatly appreciate knowing um, that God's word would go forward as we were away. My mother passed peacefully to her rest on July 14th, your prayers and thoughts and cards, um, knowing that you were praying for us, buoyed up our family. We know the next face that she will see will be the face of Jesus. And that's the hope. It seems somewhat unusual that our congregation has had nine different families who've lost loved ones in the last, over nine in the last year. So they have also become part of that group that has an additional cause, additional reason to look forward to seeing Jesus very soon. Let us pray as we go to God's word. Father, it's good to be in your house to worship you. And as we do so, Father, we are more keenly aware of our dependence on you, more keenly aware of our mission and our purpose, more keenly aware that as we come into your presence, it is only you that can fill us by your spirit, move us and shape us after the likeness of Christ, to fill us with that passion, to fill us with that purpose, that we might be used of you as we draw into your presence in oneness now. We ask that you will bless us through Christ's precious name. Amen. It is the words of Jesus that we will focus on this morning. And now I'm no longer in the world, but these are in the world, and I come to thee, O Holy Father. Keep through thy own name those whom thou hast given me, that they may be one as we are one. Oneness. What is it? How may we have it, and how are we blessed by it? One is a prime number which is only divisible by itself. One is such a simple word, and yet such a complex one at the same time. Oneness can be seen, oneness can be heard, oneness can be experienced. I think of the oneness of a newborn baby and the mother and father looking at that child, that gift of God, so innocent looking towards the future of all of the hope, of all of the sweetness, just a few minutes old, oneness in all of its innocence. I think of the oneness of a choir. Did you like the bell choir this morning? 
where you lifted heavenward as each of the tones rang forth. The oneness of a choir working together to praise God. I think of the oneness that is exhibited in a baseball team. I think of the oneness that is exhibited in the Olympic teams. I think of perhaps oneness would be used to describe in almost its entirety what discipleship is all about. Oneness, such an easy word to roll off of our lips. Oneness, such a difficult word to live out at times. For you see, we live in a, in a divided nation. We live in a time in which there is ever-increasing animosity. We live in a nation that is being divided by racism, sexism, terrorism, individualism, socialism, and you can add the isms and schisms to that. And the end of that list is almost endless. We live in a fractured world. We live in a time that would hardly resemble the words one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice. For how many? For all. Oneness. It's almost extinguished. It's almost gone. It's almost a thing of the past. Being surpassed and replaced by what is it that I want? Where can I find it in 150 characters or less? And if I can't find it to my liking, I will just create it. As if to say, I, by myself, am one and can encompass oneness. The problem with that is oneness doesn't exist with just one. Because by very definition, there must be more than one to achieve oneness. Does that make sense in sort of an oxymoron at the same time? How is it that two can become one? How is it that a family of six can take on the characteristic of being one? So today, we're going to look at Acts chapter 2. Because as we go back, to the early, early church, we can learn some lessons that may apply to our lives that we, as a church today and as individuals living today, might learn from them the lessons of oneness and incorporate some of those lessons in our individual lives. So I'd invite you, if you have your Bibles, or take the pew Bible out in front of you, to turn to chat, uh, Acts chapter 2. We'll start by looking at several texts in Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2, verse 10. Christ brings, uh, the disciples were coming under condemnation as the miracle was worked. As the lame was given, uh, given wholeness and the man was standing as uh, tangible evidence of Christ's healing power before them the scribes and the Pharisees and the rulers of the day took issue with that. The whole, Christ brings wholeness. The first thing to know is when there is oneness in the community and God's Spirit is poured out, there's a wholeness that is restored to man. Do you find that in your experience? When you come into the presence of others, there's a peacefulness, there's a wholeness, there's a oneness, there's an openness that restores, rebuilds, and rejuvenates uh, relationships. There's also the redeeming aspect of being one. And the oneness 
with God in his word. Verse 12 says, Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men, whereby you must be what? Whereby you must be saved. It is through Christ and his one name that we have salvation. And it is that oneness through Christ that brings us the hope and salvation that we enjoy today. One with Christ, redeemed. After they were redeemed, the report went forth went for throughout all the land. In verse 13, Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant, they marveled. And they took knowledge of them. I like that. I like that. There was something different about these people. It didn't take a degree behind their name. It didn't take some affirmation from another group proclaiming, these are the people that are going to bring you something special. These are the people that were filled with the Holy Spirit. And the world is looking forward to a group who will be filled with the Holy Spirit today. And they were known that they had been with whom? With Jesus. How is it in Acts chapter 4, verse 13, that they had been with Jesus? The oneness of being with Christ. Were they always with Jesus? Not so when he was crucified. They were hiding in the upper room, afraid to be identified with Christ, realizing at some point in their experience as Jesus appeared to them, it was safe to trust in Jesus. It was safe to proclaim Jesus. Despite the issues and the persecution of the day, they went boldly before to take the name of Jesus into the world that they could share with them what Jesus had done in and through their lives, that Jesus could be trusted, Jesus would heal, openness, oneness in embracing Christ. It would be amazing that the same could be accomplished today in great haste, wouldn't it? It would be amazing that the gospel which Jesus has given to his church would flood around the world. Today we have technology as such a time as never before. This message can go forward around the world in a few seconds. And we have the technology that the message can go forward. But Christ is looking forward for a people who will carry the message into all the world. Do you believe that, friends? I do. That oneness, as it takes hold of our hearts, as it takes hold of our being, as it captures our thoughts and our imagination, the oneness that Christ wants to go forward from this place of worship, friends, is into all of your world today. He's depending upon you to take this oneness and model it to those in the workplace, the neighbors to the left of your house, the neighbors to the right of your house, the stranger on the bus, the person on the airplane, you wonder, should I say anything about the gospel? To the person sitting on the curb, how is the gospel going to go forth? It's going to go forth when there's a oneness and a connection between every believer to the throne of grace. And the oneness of purpose captures our heart. So much so that when we look at another person, we no longer see them as somebody of a different race. So much so that we don't see them based on where they are in society. So much so that we don't see them above us, below us. We see them as someone who Jesus died on the cross for. That's the oneness that will propel the mission and purpose of the church forward. Do you believe that, friends? I do. And time is short. They were known, and it was reported in verse 13, that they had been with whom? They had been 
with Jesus. They had not been with the National Enquirer. They had not been with the D, uh, DNC or the Republican Party's convention. They had been with Jesus. So I took myself to the place called Oneness. It's a quiet place. And I reflected how often in my life have I extended the character of Christ to those we come in contact. And immediately the devil said, well, you sure blew it there and there and there and there and there. And I said, thank you, Lord, that you can forgive me. Thank you, Lord, that you've given me today. Thank you, Lord, that I have the opportunity to take the oneness of your life and character to each person I come in contact with. Verse 18 says, there was that oneness. But verse 18 says, and they called and commanded them not to, and they called and commanded them not to speak at all or teach in the name of Jesus. Isn't that the way it works? God wants to take his message forward. Wait a minute. Live it before you speak it. Verse 20, though, says, we, we cannot but speak of these things which we have seen and what? Heard. It's not about me or I. It's about the things which we have seen and heard. There is one thing that they cannot argue, they being others, in the, uh, in the dialogue of conversation. They can argue scripture. They can argue arguments. They can argue beliefs. They can argue doctrines. They can say, your truth is just as valid as my truth. One thing that they cannot argue is your testimony. Do you believe that, friends? There is something compelling about when a person says, have you experienced this? Here is what God has laid on my heart. Here's how he has worked in my life. We must speak of things which we have seen and heard because of the oneness of Christ speaking to us. For the oneness of the words that we have heard and read in Scripture. Verse 21, and here's what happens as a result. I, I am just shrinking this as quickly as possible. You have to go back home and read this multiple times. Verse 21, so when they had further threatened them, they let them go, finding nothing, how they might punish them because of the people. For all men... Notice the verb, glorified God for that which was done. What did they do? What was this oneness all about? What was the result in the individual's life? They all glorified God. Do you like to come into the presence of people that say, God is good, God is great, and I'm glad to be a follower of him? Do you like that? If you do, say amen. Amen. Now, give people a chance to do the same. Glorify God, not in a braggadocious way of something that I've accomplished and God helped me do it. It's not about our accomplishments. It's about the oneness experience of realizing that God works through humble agencies such as me and you. Bringing glory not to ourselves, but glory to God and connecting them with the Lord Jesus Christ. It's that oneness that brings glory to God. It's that oneness in verse 29. And now, Lord, behold, there's threatenings. They grant unto thy servants that with all boldness they might speak, thy being your word. So how do we glorify God? We do it by asking the Holy Spirit that we might be bold and humbly proclaim the word of God and not be obnoxious. Have you ever run into somebody who's obnoxious? 
in their testimony. Oh, I hear. That's kind of like fingers on a, on a chalkboard, isn't it, when the preacher says that? But being bold that they may speak thy word. Being bold is being courageous. It's being courageous when you don't feel like it. I don't know if they'll understand. I don't know what to say. And the Spirit says, go forward. And speak the word in loving kindness and in truth with a compelling way to touch their hearts. Verse 31 says, when they had prayed, here are the two things that are necessary. When they had prayed, the place was shaken. And they were assembled, and they were filled with the Holy Ghost. And they spoke the word of God with all what? Boldness. Can you say the word boldness? They spoke with the what? Boldness. As they were filled with the Holy Ghost. And verse 32 says, And the multitude that believed, here's the part. If you like to write in your Bibles and underline in your Bibles, you'll want to underline this verse. And the multitude of them that were of one heart and of one soul. One heart and one soul. Neither said any of them ought to the things which he possessed. We're going to move to that in just a second. One heart and one soul. Is it good to be in oneness? I love to see oneness in couples. But the truth is sometimes that oneness is real diverse. I want my way. He wants his way. And we go different ways. And then there's the oneness of reconciliation. And the oneness of purpose that supersedes the individuality. Oneness of heart. Oneness of soul. Where does that come from? How can it be achieved? It's in the quiet times. It's in the reaching out, God, give me that oneness that I can see in nature. Give me that oneness that I can experience in community. Give me that oneness that I can achieve and experience in family. It doesn't always exist. Sometimes it's fleeting. Sometimes it's lengthy. But it's the oneness of heart, oneness of soul, so that what happens, What happens to the individual as they come into oneness of God? And I'm going to suggest to you, the oneness of God comes first. But the completeness of oneness doesn't happen until you come into oneness with each other, each person that is in your world. Do you believe that? It's only partial oneness. For you see, our oneness to God is nurturing and fueling our relationship with Him. But those who He died on the cross for and wants to reach is a oneness between us and them that needs to be bridged. It says they were of one heart and one soul. Now, here comes the peace that strikes right at Sometimes a selfishness of the soul. So much so, neither said any of them that ought of the things which he possessed was his own. It's no longer mine, God. It's yours. You loaned it to me. My car, my house, my hobbies, my, 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 my. Wait a minute, it's all yours. But they had all things, what does the Bible say? In common. I might suggest in oneness. That's a troublesome verse. When you just reflect on it through this next week, because the Holy Spirit's going to be nagging you to fully understand all of the ramifications of that. Because it's not just talking about possessions. It's talking about quality relationships, depths of caring. 
and all of those pieces of connection. And we can take all of those and say, yeah, those are all good. But for some, there's that rub. What about possessions? We hold all things of God in oneness. What would that look like? What would change? I say part of the experience that the disciples had was as Christ worked and the Holy Spirit worked, that oneness of saying, what I have is God's and what I have is yours. Verse 33, And with great power gave the apostles witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. Verse 33 is part of the reward. And great grace was upon them all. Great power and great grace. That's what I want. How about you, friends? Isn't it amazing that when we have that oneness, we have a fuller revelation of God's great grace? And verse 37 says, Oh, by the way, having land, they sold it, and they brought the money and laid it upon the apostles' feet, and all of the sharing that went on. It would have been easier if some of those verses weren't there, wouldn't it? I, I just love the way God does it. You know, Jesus first, goodness and grace, healing, Holy Spirit, relationship with Him. Now comes oneness here, oneness with our brothers and sisters in Christ. Oneness in truth, oneness in goodness, oneness in grace, and oneness in my possessions with others. A fullness of oneness and responsibility. Because I believe he doesn't have any hands except our hands. I believe he doesn't have any tongues except our tongues. I, don't, I believe that he doesn't have any people but us to reflect his character on earth. Do you believe that, friends? I do. So let me, um, in summary and compression, uh, the completeness of oneness actually exists in several areas in our life, and I'm just going to bullet point them. With our mind, we're one with Christ. In our heart, he says, let this mind be in you. In our heart, he'll give us a new heart. Our hands, He'll give us holy hands, our words are the words of Christ, our deeds, our desires, and our actions. All to be filled in the oneness of Christ. So that we find the peacefulness of oneness, the joy of oneness. The oneness in church, the oneness that creates synergy, the oneness that moves mission, the oneness that exemplifies Christ. It was July 22, in case you're wondering where I'm going. Uh, indeed, we're coming in for a landing. Uh, there's two stories I'd like to share with you about oneness. It was July 22. It was two days before my mother's memorial service that I turned on the news to see the little blurb across the bottom of the screen, Sand Canyon Fire, now 20,000 acres. My mind immediately flashed back to 2003 the Valverde fire, which burned to Ventura. It was 100,000 plus acres. I thought, as long as it was up in Valverde, everything was safe. We had been here three years. It promptly made a U-turn, came all the way back to Stevenson Ranch. So much so that there were 35 fire trucks in our subdivision. Now I'm 1,000 miles away from home, and I'm watching this go across the screen. And I'm wondering, which way are the winds blowing? Now, I have a certain um, conflict of interest here. God, if you can, make them blow in a certain direction. I was uh, um, somewhat relieved to learn that they were westerly winds blowing the fire east of the 14, and we live west of the 5. And I said, you know, Lord, it doesn't really matter. You know, anything I have can be replaced. 
It's all paper, steel. I've got Karen and family with me. It really doesn't matter. There's insurance and all that kind of stuff. If, you're, you, know, if you suffered through that fire, I'm not uh, belittling your loss or if you've had to evacuate. But nevertheless, what I learned out about, uh, a, le- uh, a lesson learned out of that was a lesson of oneness. For you see, when there's a fire, who's mobilized? This, who's mobilized when there's a fire? Who comes? Firefighters come. Good, we're together. We're of one mind. 30, over 3,600 firefighters answered the call. 3,600 people coming from all different directions. They could have been home with their families. They could have been doing a hundred different things. Their lives were busy. Probably the last place and the first place they'd rather be was on that fire line, protecting your homes, protecting your goods. But they answered the call. They had a mission and a purpose. I believe the church is living in a world that's on fire today, spiritually on fire today. The fires of evil are raging to break down society, to take people from righteousness into wickedness, to blind the truth from their eyes, to deceive everyone they can. And I'm wondering, I'm wondering who's going to answer the call? Who's going to be the one who will go forward and say, I will take the cause of Christ forward. What would be said in the Santa Clarita Valley if the 250 members of the Seventh-day Adventist Church went forward from this place and said, Friend, do you know what it's like to have Jesus as your friend? That oneness flowing from Christ into each person that you come in contact with. There's something, something about oneness, that it must be experienced really before it can be shared. My story of oneness is a personal story. The person who brought oneness into my family was my mom. She taught us at an early age that every person you come in contact with is somebody to be respected and loved. It was her wish. It was her wish as she was in the hospital. She said, I want to go home. She talked with me privately and she said, you know, what I want is a family to remain together. A oneness. She knew, based on our family history, we weren't always that way. For you see, we all loved each other, but at times we were all very, very, independent. As we gathered around her after she had fought with multiple myeloma for over 18 months and she was fully sedated, we knew that time was short. But in, in an unusual way, her power to connect us with her great love for us and bring us together in oneness was an amazing thing. As I looked at my brother and two sisters and dad, because we knew she had, her body was worn out and she only had a few more moments and she went peacefully to sleep when she drew 
her last breath. You see, our lives, our lives can be examples of oneness, the oneness of love that connects us to Christ and the oneness of love that connects us one to another. For the words of Jesus were, the words of Jesus were, Father, that they might be one, even as we are one. May we experience that oneness. Let us pray. Gracious Father, into your presence, we have come this morning. We have come, Father, to glorify you. We've come, Father, to worship you. We've come, Father, with a full realization. At times we are distanced from you. At times we are estranged from you. At times we are distanced from those we love. But, Father, create in our hearts the capacity to be one with you. And out of that oneness, Father, change our characters in our lives that we might be not only one with you, but one with another. Father, that word might go forth from this place. These are a people who have been with Jesus. These are a people that I want to know more about. These are a people that know Jesus in ways that I have yet to know. Oh, Father, bless us with your Holy Spirit. Fill us with boldness. Fill us with kindness. Fill us with love. And fill us with your oneness. For we ask in Christ's precious name. Amen.